28. Okay, here we go again, back to basics Bible study. This is session 21. I am uh, your host or your facilitator, um, your teacher of this um, virtual Zoom Bible study. Um, it's back to basics Bible study. We, we are covering Exodus chapter 28 and 29 tonight and 32 and 33. Um, we're doing it like that because on the previous, uh, very last session, session 20, we had to deal with the tabernacle itself and it kind of jumped around per chapter. So um, if you're just now tuning in and you missed last session, we're doing Exodus chapter 28, 29, then we're going to do 32 and 33, and that'll get us back on track. Amen? Amen. Back to Basics Bible Study, our weekly uh, virtual or Zoom Bible study. If you are listening in or viewing by YouTube, uh, if you are viewing this several days later or whenever your time period is, we thank you for tuning in to um, learn of God's Word. We will ask one simple thing, that you subscribe. You subscribe, you like, you share, you tell people about it, you hit the notifications button so that you will be notified when new videos come up. And we put them up every week, amen? Amen. This ministry, we stand on 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, which is simply stated, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You have to believe God is the creator and God is who he is and God's word is inspired by God, written by man, but inspired by him so that the man or mankind of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You are not thoroughly furnished unto all good works unless you study God's word. Here at Basic, uh, Back to Basic Bible Study, we do just that. We study the Bible and the Bible alone, um, God's precept upon precept. So now we're on chapter 28. We're dealing with the children of Israel. We're dealing with after the Exodus. Um, we're, we're dealing with after the Mount Sinai occasion when Moses went up on, Mount, on the Mount and God gave him all the instructions and gave him the law, gave him the uh, commandments. He gave them all the instructions to build the tab tabernacle and all the specifics for that. Now, while that was happening, there were other things going on at the bottom of the mountain, and we would deal with that. And they were going on at the same time. But as far as Moses knows, the only thing he knows is he's on the mount, he's with God, he's hearing from God, he is receiving the instruction from the laws, meaning the commandments and all the laws. It was not just 10, remember, it was over 600 of them, but the 10 are 10 groupings that if you can follow those, then you're okay. And the greatest commandment of all is to love the Lord thy God with all your heart and soul and to love thy neighbor as thyself. If you can do those two, then you know that you can do the rest of it. So while Moses was on the mount receiving this, he also received instructions for the priesthood who would be the priest what they would wear what they would do okay so that's where we are now chapter 28 says the garments for the priesthood and i know most bible studies have never even covered this before but it's in the bible so what does that mean i mean it's important so we promised god when we started this and we was going to go chapter by chapter book by book that's what we're going to do so look at chapter 28 my brother my sister it says, garments for the priesthood. Now, uh, God said to take Aaron, Aaron and his sons, that they may minister to me as priests. This is God himself, the most high God, Yahweh, the Lord, speaking to Moses on the mount, that they may minister to me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nabab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, okay? Aaron's son. So Aaron was to be the priest. His sons would be the priests as well. Okay. So what you have to remember with that or keep in your mind with that is that what he was doing was just like you have a pastor and assistants. He was saying that Aaron is the high priest, the high priest. Okay. And Aaron's sons were to be his helpers. They were to be ordained as priests as well, but not the high priest, 
okay? So want to make sure to put that in your mind early so that you could frame that so that when we're speaking that you know what we're talking about. It'll make sense to you, okay? God went on to say, make holy garments for them, okay? Specifically, the breastplate, the ephod. We always talk about the breastplate at ch in church, right? The ephod. Some of, some of us never heard of that. The robe, the tunic, the turban, the sash. Then he says, I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, gifted artisans to make the garments. Here he goes again with this same statement. You remember last session, he made that statement in reference to he chose who he was going to use to head or be the head, I'm just saying this word, carpenters, um, just using that phrase, carpenters uh, or artisans to build a tabernacle after he gave the instructions. He gave instructions of who he wanted to build it. Well, now he's given instructions of who he wants to make these garments because they are to be holy. Uh, only the high priest and the priest could wear them. So what God is saying is, I have imparted within them the wisdom to know how to do it to my specifications. Now, let me say this again that I said last session. This is personal, okay? This is personal. In my prayer, almost every day, I include, Lord, give me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. This scripture right here tells you that God imparted into the individuals what they did not know, and he gave them to the gift of being an artesian to make these garments. So he imparted the wisdom, the know-how, and the skills to give them everything they needed to complete the task. Amen, somebody, did you catch what I'm trying to tell you, okay? Like an old preacher used to say, are you picking up what I'm putting down, okay? No matter who you are, if God has called you to do something, or if you are praying over something and it is in God's will for you to do it, pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. No matter if you've never done it before in your life, God can impart wisdom within you at the blink of an eye. Amen? Amen. Let's move on. Let's, let's move on. So uh, let's talk about the different pieces of this holy garment. If it is detailed in the Bible, it's worth mentioning, okay? So it spoke of the ephod. The ephod is a vest-like garment worn by the high priest, woven and reflecting the colors of the sanctuary. Now, yes, you will see a whole section in your Bible with the ephod. I'm not going to read all of that. I'm just paraphrasing it for you. It had two onyx stones bearing the names of Israel's 12 sons, six on both stones, on one on each side, and they were listed in the order of birth, and those stones were on each shoulder. So the ephod, at the top of the ephod, there was a stone on each shoulder. The 12 tribes was listed, six on each side. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I will try to make sure not to say that, and I said it anyway. The 12 sons were listed. Six on each side, not the 12 tribes. The 12, son, the 12 sons were listed, okay? And they were listed in order of birth, okay? So to give you an idea, one shoulder had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, and Naphtali. The other shoulder had Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin, okay? Those were the stones. So then you move to the breastplate. We all, we pretty much heard of the breastplate, okay? It contained four rows of three stones. So four down three is 12, okay? Each jewel or stone contained the name of one of the 12 tribes. So the shoulder stones had the 12 names. The stones on the front of the breastplate had the 12 tribes. So for you guys that have been with me from the beginning and you know the story, whose name is not listed? Whose name 
is not listed on the breastplate, okay? So on the ephod, the 12 names were listed, six on each shoulder. Come on in, cuz, I see you. On the breastplate, the 12 tribes. Remember, Joseph's name is not listed with the tribes. Why? Because he got a double portion, remember? He got a double portion. His two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, they received the name tribes. So he got two tribes from him, right? And Levi was omitted. Remember? So now you have across the top, Zebulun, Issachar, Judah. Next row, Gad, Simeon, Reuben. Next row from left to right, Benjamin, Manasseh, Ephraim. There go Ephraim, okay? Then the last row of three, Naphtali, Asher, and Dan. Joseph and Levi are not listed. They're listed under the 12 brothers by order, but not the 12 tribes. And we went through that full explanation in a previous session, okay? So go back and listen to that session if you missed it, okay? Because that was a lot of information. We had a lot of questions over that, okay? So it was one, speaking of the breastplate, those are just come in. Uh, chapter 28, chapter 28, we're talking about the breastplate. One over Aaron's heart when he goes before the Lord, okay? Aaron uh, is the high priest, not just the priest, only one high priest, Aaron. Other priests, his sons, we're just regular priests, okay? Now, it's two words in there that threw you guys off, I know. Uh, the Urim and the Thunum, okay? If I'm pronouncing that right. It was located in the inside of the inside of the fold of the breastplate. So the breastplate was made to where it folded over and it had somewhat of a pocket or space in between so that he could stick the Urim and the Thummim inside of it okay now i gotta explain this hear me well and you guys know I'm, I'm a stickler for this the bible does not detail what the urim and thunum is or what they are should i say <laughs> okay so if you do research this is something you will find but I must specifically tell you, it's not detailed in the Bible what it was for, okay? So this is a theory. Now, I told you, this is not about what Reverend Corey thinks. This is about studying the Bible as it is written and what research we can do that pertains to the Bible. It's not about my feelings, okay? Now, imagine, okay, let me put this in the simplest way, okay? One was for yes, one was for no. So when he went before the Lord, like one was black and one was white. That we do know, okay? So if the question was asked, um, could they do something? Uh, would, were they to go to war or were they to fight against this um, nation or, or when the tribes came to him for disputes and he had to go before the Lord, anything like that, the answer was given through the Urim and the Thronum. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. So it was yea or nay, yes or no. Now, some type of way he was given, I don't know, you can, your mind can say something like one, he could feel a shake in one or one was raised and one wasn't. I don't know. The Bible does not specify. But these were two instruments used to receive answers from the Lord. Okay, and so they fit in. He could slide them into the breastplate in between the little gap. So when he went before the Lord in the Holy of Holies, and only he could do that, when he went before the Lord and sought the Lord for answers, his answers was given using these things. Okay, so I know most of you guys never heard of that before, so hopefully that blessed you. Okay, moving right along. So we did the E5 which is a vest-like covering, the breast, the blessed, the <laughs> breastplate. Um, now the robe, it was all blue, opening at the top for the head. It had golden bells and pomegranates around the hem of it to give off a sound uh, just in case he might die. <laughs> and that's exactly what it means, okay? 
The purpose of the bells, okay, the pomegranates was decorated, but the purpose of the bells, if the high priest went inside the Holy of Holies, he will go on the Day of Atonement. Make sure you listen to the last session. Keep up with these sessions now. I'm posting them, doing a lot of work for you guys, okay? He went into the Holy of Holies once, one day a year, the Day of Atonement, okay? If he went in there and he was not right, he was killed instantly. So he had to go before the Lord at first, be rid of any sins that he committed, make any sacrifice, be cleansed, be consecrated, make sacrifices unto God before he stepped foot behind that veil. If he went behind that veil and he was not clean or standing righteous before God or holy before God, he would die instantly. He had a lot of responsibility, okay? So you said, where the bells come in? His sons could not go into the Holy of Holies, but they were, or the most holy section of the tabernacle, I'm speaking of, they were in the holy place, which is the very first section inside the tabernacle, divided into two, the holy place, the most holy place, or we call the Holy of Holies, okay? They would stand in the holy place and listen for the bells on their father. If they stop hearing those bells, they know dead it wasn't right when he went in there and they no longer have a father. And that is the truth, okay? Um, come on in, guys, come on in. So that is the truth. That's the purpose of the bells on the hymn. Now, you have one scholar says that uh, when he went into the Holy of Holies, he had some type of rope on him to where they did not, um, it did not hear the bells anymore. They could pull his body out because they could not go inside there as well. Now, the scripture doesn't say that. So I just throw that out there as a little jokey joke, but I'm just saying, you know, uh, I can tell you that that was the purpose of the bells, okay? Uh, so that they would know if he was still alive inside the Holy of Holies. Because if he was not right or righteous before God, he would instantly die. Then what would happen if he did? The next son in line would take over as the high priest and they would have to do all this over again and anoint him as the high priest, okay? Moving right along. The turban. The turban was a headpiece with a gold plate engraved on the front that stated holiness to the Lord, holiness to the Lord. What that phrase meant, when you translate that phrase, it meant ownership to the Lord or belonging to. So that meant consecrated to God or belonging to God, okay? The plate had to be worn on the front of the headpiece or the turban on Aaron's forehead as to bear or similar to bear the iniquity of the children of Israel, that they may be accepted before the Lord. Why? Because Aaron was a high priest. He was going in for the people, praying in intercession for the people, making sacrifices for the people. So he was bearing their iniquity. So what is that like? That is a picture of Christ. Who is our high priest? Jesus Christ, Yahshua, the Messiah. Okay, uh, Yahshua HaMashiach, Yahshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, okay? It's not speaking in tongues, guys, that's Hebrew, okay? So relax. Okay, so the original name of Jesus has been found, Yahshua, or Yeshua, however, is pronounced uh, Yahweh, the proper name for God, Yah, hallelujah, all praises to God, Yah, or God, okay? So uh, when I say that, please understand what I'm speaking of. So. Uh, the next is the tunic. So when we're going through these things, you can see the relation of thought. You can see that these things are pictures <coughs> or glimpses of Jesus Christ to come. That's what you got to keep in mind. You should be able to now, you've been with me long enough, that you should be able to now say, oh, that's like Jesus Christ. Oh, that's like Jesus Oh, yeah, I understand that. Well, God is doing that because that's a picture of Christ. So Aaron, the high priest, is a picture of Jesus Christ to come, okay? So uh, is an example or a picture of, okay? So now we have the tunic. 
The tunic is a white linen coat woven of one piece and close fitting, okay? The next we have the sash. And for those of you guys that are looking by video, I'm going to put up a picture in a second. If you received the email, I included a picture in that email so you can see it. I'm, I'm you know, I'm a person that I, I, I'm very visual. So I like to, like to look at pictures and reference a lot of pictures. So now we have the sash, um, which is bound around the waist, made of the same material as the ephod. So this is to tie everything together around the waist um, or a girdle as it can say, like when the scripture says to gird up your loins, this is what they're talking about, okay? Uh, a sash tied around your waist to gird up your loins. It was about the width of three fingers wide, and it said you shall make for Aaron's sons tunics, sashes, and hats, linen trousers to cover their nakedness. Verse 20, okay? Now, why did it say linen trousers to cover their nakedness? You remember in the previous session, like I said, we keeping this as simple as possible so that we can all learn this together and understand this together and connect the dots, okay? Remember when God was speaking of building the altar, he told them not to build it on steps, but of natural stone, remember that, so that their nakedness could be covered? They did not have undergarments, okay? They did not have undergarments. So come on in, guys. Come on in. So now God is saying to the priest, now that he's making priest, official priest, he's saying, now I want you to have linen trousers or undergarments underneath your clothing, okay? Because you are now priest and you will be holy in the, in, in the sight of God. So put those two together. You should be able to remember that from the previous one, one of the previous sessions, okay? And like you see, like I said, I'm a visual guy, so I want you to look at this picture, all of you that can, okay? This is the picture of the robe and everything that you read in those chapters, in that chapter, okay? So closest to his body was the tunic, which is really like one would say a gown or something like that. Long sleeves, long uh, skirt-like gown like that went all the way to his feet. They call that a tunic. That was the clothes where he had his trousers underneath, then this tunic, fine linen tunic, okay? Then the robe, because we would, we would look at that as a robe, but don't think about it as a robe, okay? That is a tunic which is like a gown. Like, you know, it's like the closest to him, the underneath, and everything is piled on top. Then you have a robe, which went like a vestment as well, but it stopped pretty much at the knees or past the knees. It went over the tunic, okay? Then layered on top of that was what they called the ephod with all the pretty colors that you read. And it had the stones attached to the top which it had the, uh, the six names of the, of the um, sons of Israel on both sides equal to 12, right? Six and six on the shoulders. Hanging from that was the breastplate. We see that here. Oh, around his waist was the sash or gird, girdle, okay? So then it was the breastplate hanging from the two plates of onyx stones on the shoulders. And that was the 12 tribes listed. Then you go to his head and that's the turban or head covering. Or some translation said miter, M-I-T-E-R, and it had the gold plate on the front, okay? So I hope that gives you understanding. Those of you guys that cannot see this, in a couple of days, look on YouTube, go to session 21, and then you will be able to see this and it'll make sense for you, okay? Okay, amen, amen. Uh, again, I do not own the rights to this picture. It's used for information purposes only. Hey, man, somebody. Now, that concludes chapter 28. God was very specific of what he wanted the high priest and the priest to wear. Okay? Very specific. Okay? So, they had to be right, just like he was very specific on how he wanted the tabernacle built and everything in it. Now he's doing the same thing with their garments. 
okay? So here we go. Now we have uh, chapter 29. Aaron and his sons are consecrated. Consecrated. That takes us all the way over to 29. Okay. Verse 1 through 3. And I'm going to move a little bit now, guys. Okay. Verse 1 through 3. God says, uh, Aaron, this is what you shall do um, to them and hallow them for ministering to me as priests. Um, God said, and this is what, I'm sorry, I said Aaron. And this is what you shall do to them to hallow them for ministering to me as priests. Okay. So then it said, you should take one young bull and two rams along with unleavened bread, cakes, and wafers. Now, guys, there's a lot of instructions in this chapter. I cannot mention all of them, okay? So bear with me. Read it for yourself. I am pulling out the things that you definitely need to know for your understanding, okay? So I cannot cover every single word in this time period. Okay, so verse four through nine, paraphrasing, says, bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle and wash them with water. Place the holy garments on Aaron. Come on in, come on in. Place the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him with oil. Why is it saying Aaron specifically? Because Aaron would be the high priest, not the regular priest, the high priest. That's why it says put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him with oil. Just like I tell y'all all the time, slow down. Read every word. It didn't say put the holy garments on the priest. It says Aaron, okay? Then, because we're going to see the differentiation between the two. So, who is our high priest? Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. Then it says, secondly, then put the priest garments on his sons. See, did y'all catch that when you read it? I don't want you to think that the breastplate and all these things went for all of them because it didn't. So I took a second to list for you in your notes, and I said for your hearing, everybody by audio, okay, what the difference was. Aaron was the high priest. He had the robe. He had the ephod. He had the breastplate. He had the sash, the turban, the crown, and he was anointed by oil. Okay. His sons were regular priests. They only had the tunic and a sash to tie the tunic, and they were given hats. It does not say that it was the turban. It said, it specifically said hats. So that means it's a different hat. Okay. So Aaron had everything, the sons only had the tunic and the sash to tie the tunic, and a priest hat, but not the turban, okay? You know, he was very, very clear on this. But if you read that too fast, you missed that there was a difference between what they wore, okay? So um, verse 10, you know, you can, you can liken that too as, as <laughs> I like to say that word, it's likened unto when we, your, our churches pretty much do communion, the pastor will have a robe on, a ceremonial robe, but uh, all of the preachers uh, or assistant pastors may not have robes on, you know, because he is handling the Holy Communion, okay? So you can compare it to that, okay? All right. So I try to give you, slide in a lot of real world examples for you guys so you can connect the dots. Okay, so verse 10 through 14, okay? They place... And you see over and over again, because I know you read it ahead of time, better. They placed their hands on the head of the animal before sacrificing it. We said the bull and the, and the rams, remember? Okay, so they placed their hands. That was ceremonially passing their guilt or iniquities onto the animal, and then the animal was sacrificed. This is what they were doing, okay? So... In that group of verses 10 through 14, you'll see the sacrifice of the bull. And you can read all of that, all the specifics of what they had to do to sacrifice the bull, okay? I can, I'm not going to go through each little line of that. But that 
was a sin offering, an offering for that sin. It was a sin offering, okay? Verse 15 through 18, they sacrificed the ram for a burnt offering, a burnt offering. Verse 19 through 21, they sacrificed the ram. They sprinkled the blood on the altar and Aaron and his sons, okay? So that is consecrating them for service. They set apart for service, sprinkled oil on the clothes and on Aaron and his sons. So they sprinkled the blood, then they sprinkled holy oil. And I put a little side note in there, that's covered. We always say, I plead the blood, and this is what was happening, okay? They were sprinkling the blood, they was covering them with the blood. Now, what is that an example of? I'm going to say it 550 million times, okay? It's an example of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, okay? The Messiah on Calvary. We don't have to make these sacrifices anymore because Christ Jesus, Yeshua, sacrificed himself for us. We don't have to do these anymore. But if you learn what they had to do then, this gives you a new sense of the importance of what Jesus Christ did for us, okay? If he would have never come and sacrificed his life for us and shed blood for us, then we would still be doing all these sacrifices, okay? If we wanted to be in right standing with God, that's the only way to do it. But now he was our ultimate sacrifice. So now we do not have to do that. And he's, he's, he's an atonement for our sins, past, present, and future. Okay? So that's what that meant, moving right along, because I'm getting excited. Verse 22 through 25, um, you will see that it said, take the fat of the lamb and use as a wave offering before the Lord. And that's exactly what it meant. They put it into the hands of the priest and open hands waved it as a wave offering, then took it back from their hands and burned it as a, as a burn offering, okay, a burnt offering, okay? Like you can use an example that they are consecrating their hands for service, okay? Or being open for service or opening their hands for service. So uh, verse 26 through 28, it said, take the breast of the lamb and use as a heave offering. You see all these different offerings under God? See, sin offering, burnt offering, wave offering, um, uh, heave offering. They're doing all these sacrifices and offering to be in right standing with God. Right standing with God. So then it says, um, verse 29, the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them. Meaning? This whole process, you will redo if something happens to Aaron. The whole process, I'm commanding now, that will be done to Aaron's sons uh, or his son when they elevate him to high priest if anything happens to Aaron. Okay? That's what that meant. To Aaron shall, uh, garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him. That's what that meant. Verse 29. Okay? So, verse 35. Seven days you shall consecrate them. That's the ceremonial seven days. And you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. Well, a bull had a hard time during this time. <laughs> he didn't stand a chance. So every day it was, a, it was an offering of a bull. It was a sin offering, okay? So uh, we don't have to do that anymore. We have Christ Jesus. But what was that doing? It was getting the people mindset to understand without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Give them scripture, right? So you have to put all that together. They're shedding blood to make atonement for their sins. Jesus Christ came and shed his blood to be the propitiation, to be the atonement, to be the sacrifice, the holy sacrifice for our sins. That's all this is doing. So it should make sense to you. You should really, really worship the Messiah like never before when you understand the importance of it. Understand the importance of it. So verse 38, I'm calming down. Verse 38, the daily offerings, two lambs of the first year, day by day continually. The lambs had a hard time as well. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. So you, 
two lambs, one offered during the day, one offered at twilight. God was not playing. The Most High was not playing about these sacrifices. Okay? So verse 42, moving right along. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with the children of Israel. 45, I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. I need to say that again. 45, I will dwell among the people of Israel and I will be there, 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 specifically their God. They are my people. I told you, he was forming his own nation unto himself. He needed people, law, and land. He formed the people. They're 2.5 million. He gave them all these laws. That's going to be their law. That's the commandments. Okay, the promised land is a land. That's what he's moving them to. When they get there and conquer that, then they will be an official nation. Now, I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God, period. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Well, why are you making it such a point with that? I'm about to tell you. So now, remember, okay, that concludes chapter 29. Now remember, we did 30 and 31 last session because they're still talking about the tabernacle. Now, everybody, pay attention to me. I know you already are, but just get this. Hear my words. The tabernacle is not built yet, people, okay? We haven't got to that part. Everything God said was instructions, and that is confusing, y'all, okay? Everything he said is instructions. All that he said about Aaron and the garments is instructions. Moses is still on top of the mount receiving the instructions, okay? That's why I broke these chapters up and did it like I did it so that, you, so that it wouldn't confuse you, okay? So the tabernacle haven't been built yet. All these instructions about the clothing, they haven't been made yet. None of that. God is saying, do all of these things that I have told you, and the end result is I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of Egypt, that I may dwell among them, dwell among my people, which is the same thing he wanted to do in the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve messed that up, okay? So, what well, Satan messed that up. So, this is what he's saying. I will dwell among them. This is how people ask you, how can a holy God dwell with unholy people? Because he was in the town, his presence would be dwelling in the tabernacle. No one could go in there, but it was positioned in the middle with the 12 tribes positioned like armies around the camp. That's how holy God can dwell among his people. So now, here we go. Here we go. Go to verse 32. I mean, chapter 32. We already did 30, 31 last session. Go to chapter 32. You will see in your Bible, it says the gold calf or the golden calf incident, okay? 742, I got time, okay? Chapter 32, the gold calf. It says, now they saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain. Stop right there. So do you get it? All these things that you have read is instructions for the future. Nothing has happened happened yet. Moses was still on top of the mountain. Okay? The people were still at the bottom. Okay? So, that means that they were sitting there waiting for Moses to come down. Okay? So, it says, now they saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain. Come, make gods that they shall go before us as for this Moses, the man, who brought us out of Egypt, we do not know what has come of him. Now, 
The easiest way for me to get you to understand how bad this is, is imagine a father doing everything for his children from birth and they turn around and slap him in the face, <laughs> okay? Their words were, the man who brought us out of Egypt. Did the man bring them out of Egypt? No, sir, no ma'am. God brought them out of Egypt. That's why I read for you four times that they should know that I am the God who brought them out of Egypt and that I may dwell among them. God deserves the credit. But they are saying, I don't know what happened to the man that brought us out of Egypt, giving God no credit whatsoever. Okay? Verse 2, Aaron told them to bring him all the gold earrings that they had. And Aaron made it into a golden calf. Now, I'm paraphrasing all of this. The people said, this is your God people of Israel who brought you out of Egypt. Now, they are saying that a calf, a model, a gold statue, that's the best way to put it, a gold statue of a calf is what brought you out of Egypt and you just made the calf today. So the calf wasn't in existence. You didn't make it before you went to Egypt or while you were in Egypt. So how can, the, how can the calf be the one that brought you out of Egypt? But they were being, what you need to catch here is that I've always told you guys, there was only one nation serving the most high God, and that was Israel. Everybody else was serving Satan, everybody else. So they couldn't help but to notice and to look at and to be influenced, shall I say, by pagan or satanic worshiping, the worshiping of false gods. So that's where they get this stuff from, okay? And they were surrounded by it in Egypt, okay? So moving right along. Now, secondly, what was Aaron supposed to be doing? I told you in a previous session, you read in your Bible, Aaron was in charge. He was looking after the people. Is he consecrated as a high priest yet? No, that hasn't happened yet. But he was supposed to be watching over the people. And he allowed them to do this and gave them instructions on how to do it. <laughs> yeah. So verse six, the people built an altar and offered burnt offerings, peace offerings, as well as a feast to this false God. Now, didn't the Most High God, the Lord, just give instructions to Moses on all the offerings they were supposed to have unto him. And they're down in the valley or at the bottom of the mountain doing offerings and feasts unto a fake God that they just made. Just made. Today. Ridiculous. But that's the theme of the children of Israel. Okay? And that's why we're in the situation we're in now. But we will get to that later. Verse 7. God told Moses, go, <laughs> get down. That's what my Bible said. Go, get down. Verse 7, chapter 32, okay? Exclamation point. The people have corrupted themselves. They have turned away quickly from my commandments. Now, that word corrupted, I know you didn't catch this, so I'm pointing it out to you. You do a word study on that word in this particular context, in this verse itself, that word corrupted means of no longer use. Like something spoiled and you throw it away. Wow. I'm telling you. So God says they have corrupted themselves. What he is saying, you got to get this, what he is saying is they are no longer of use to me. Let me let that sink in for a second. The nation that he has done all of these things for, provided manna for them daily, led them by day and by night. He says, I have no longer any use for them. That's what that word corrupted means in verse seven. 
okay? God told Moses, I have seen these people. They are a stiff-necked people. They look forward. They look at what's in front of them. They don't remember where they come from or who brought them out. That's what he's saying. They'll change on me at a dime. <laughs> Verse 10, God says, leave me that, may, that my wrath may burn against them and I shall consume them and I will get this people, slow down in your reading, I will make of you a great nation. Did you see that in verse 10? I will make of you. What God was saying, step to the side. I'm about to kill everybody. And I'm going to start over from scratch with Moses. Did you catch that when you read that? I will make of you a great nation. Mm, that's what he was saying. He was saying, my plan must go forward. I'm no short of my word. My plan and my promise and my purpose will go forward, but I'm going to just start over. And I'm going to start over with you. And my wrath will consume all of them. Or at least all of them that participated in this act. That we do know by our Bible. So verse 11 through 14, Moses pleaded with the Lord and used his own words against him. Okay, please read that set of scripture. It's beautiful. It's a, it's a prime example of what we should be doing. Learn scripture, learn your verses, learn what, what they mean, quote God's word back to him. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. You said I'm a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. You said I'm blessed. I'm abundantly blessed. Quote his word back to him. That's what Moses did. So Moses says, don't let your wrath burn against the people. The Egyptians will be able to say that you did all this to just bring the people out in the wilderness and kill the people anyway. So don't let them say that. Get the honor from this. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Remember, what is he telling them? Remember the covenant. Remember the Abrahamic covenant that you have promised. I will make thee a great nation. I will make your name great. Remember the covenant you swore. So he put God's words right back in the face of God. He was not being disrespectful. He was quoting God's word right back to him. God, you said this, and I trust and believe what your word is. Now, this is a different Moses than the Moses that was in Egypt. Same man, but different mentality. He's confident in his word now. He's not saying, oh, I'm a man of bad speech. Let Aaron speak for me. No, he's speaking boldly back to the Lord saying, oh, no, you've established this covenant. You've established a covenant with me. You have to honor your word. And the scripture says, so the Lord did not destroy the people. Mm. By the words of Moses, now, again, what is that a picture of? That's a picture of the Savior, the Christ, always in praying and intercession for us sitting at the right hand of the Father. Put two and two together, guys. I'm trying to make sure the Bible makes sense to you so you can understand everything that is written. So verse 15 through 20, Moses came down from the mountain and saw for himself the sin of the people. Mm, imagine that. Imagine that feeling he had. So Moses threw down and broke the tablets which he was carrying. What was on those tablets? the commandments that was written by the finger of God. He was so upset, he broke the, the tablets, the stone tablets that the commandments was written on. Then Moses took the calf and burned it and ground it, the Bible says, into power, scattered it in the water and made the people drink so that they would bear the sin. And you say, why did he do that? So they would bear the sin that they did. They had to digest that sin. Oh, my God. Think about it. And that all of that calf was consumed, or the image of that calf, the statue of it. Mm. That'll preach right there. That'll preach. Verse 21 through 22. Moses asked Aaron, why did he allow this? You know, Aaron tried to ease his way out of it. You know that, right? Aaron replied, you know the people. These people are set on evil. 
So meaning Aaron was saying they were going to do it anyway. So I just facilitated it. So, you know, I would make sure it didn't get too bad. But no, uh, no, you did exactly the opposite. You helped them and you told them what to do. So 25, Moses saw the people were unrestrained because Aaron failed in his mission, in his calling. He failed to restrain the what not calling, in his assignment. Aaron's assignment was to be over or be in charge of the people while Moses was on the mount. He failed. So Moses says, whoever is on the Lord's side, amen, somebody, come to me. We quote that all the time. Who's on the Lord's side? Yep. So the sons of Levi took up swords, the Bible says, and killed 3,000 men as punishment for the act of the golden calf. God is not playing, people. All this worshiping of false gods, God is not playing. We just finished with Halloween. Don't get me started on that. God is not playing, people. He's not playing with that. Worshiping false gods, he's not playing with that. Okay, now let me give you a little context. Uh, the 3,000 men killed was probably, if you do a little research on that, is probably the leaders or the people that were in charge that were doing all the work and leading the people to rebel. Okay, not just the average Joe that was standing by doing nothing. So, the 3,000, why was it only 3,000? Because out of the 2.5 million, these people was kind of running the show. So, he took care of them first. Okay, so. Then verse 29, Moses ordered the people to consecrate themselves, okay? After the punishment was handed down, he told them, consecrate yourself. Verse 30, the next day, Moses went up to the Lord to plead for the people. Here we go again, Christ-like, going to plead to the people. He asked God that if he could not forgive the people, then kill him instead. What is that? For the 15th time tonight, a picture of Jesus Christ, an example of Jesus Christ. I will give my life for the sins of the people. Moses is trying to give his life for the sins of the people. God replied, whoever has sinned against me, I will block them out of the book. Okay? So God is saying, not the people who didn't, but the one who sinned against me. So verse 34 said, not you, Moses. You were up here with me. You had nothing to do with it. So, excuse me, verse 34. Now go and lead the people to the land that I promised you. My angel shall lead you. Here comes that angel again. My angel shall lead you. Nevertheless, the day will come that I will punish them for their sin. He is not letting them slide, people. He's not letting them slide, okay? And verse 35, it, if you see, it ended verse round verse 35, and it says, so the Lord plagued the people because what they did with the calf which Aaron made. So we know plague is translated like sickness. So they were protected. You remember, God said, I will be with you, and I will dwell with my people. And as long as they obey, they will not have sickness and disease. I'm, trans, I'm just translating for you. You remember he said that in previous chapters? Well, now he says that the Lord plagued them for their sin. So now he's opening up his hand of protection. Y'all have chose to worship false gods. Now you will suffer plagues when I protected you from the plagues. That's what he's saying. Okay, verse 33, and we're going to end on 33, okay? This is the command to leave Sinai. He's telling them to leave. This is very powerful, okay? God says, depart and go up from here to the land that I swore to you. Sounds good, right? Sounds real good. Now the people are like, okay, they killed 3,000. They suffered the punishment, so we good. Now the Lord is telling us, go to the promised land that he promised. The Lord's going to keep his promise. Okay, we fine. Then it says, I will send my angel before you and drive out the inhabitants of the land. So he still is going to be their banner. He's going to still fight their battles for them, right? So now they're happy. They're feeling good. Look at verse 3. I will not go up in your midst. I repeat, I will not go up in your midst. Least I consume you 
on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Verse 4, the people mourn after hearing these words. Then the people were ordered to strip themselves of their ornaments. What does that mean? That group of scripture, they were happy. They thought they had got away with it. God has just told them, I will dwell with my people. That's the purpose of the tabernacle. Tabernacle is not built yet. Before it could be built, they're down there sinning. Now he sent them, instead of stopping there and build the tabernacle, now he's sending them to the land. He's telling them to leave Mount Sinai, this holy place. He's telling them to leave. Then he told them, strip yourself of your ornaments. What the meaning of that is, you took earrings off and made this calf. I said, get from the people all their ornaments, all their gold, everything that I allowed you to take from the Egyptians, okay? Why? Because I knew that I was going to use that, that gold and bronze to build the tabernacle, which we explained that last session. But what do you do? You come here while I'm giving instructions to Moses and use part of that to build a cow. So he said, strip them of all their ornaments. So their gold and their bronze. So they was looking very regal. And he took all that from them. God is upset. Okay. So then verse seven, Moses meets with the Lord. Moses took his own tent. This is phenomenal. Took his own tent and pitched it outside far from the camp. Moses called it the tabernacle or the tent. Now, it's not the real tabernacle, people. That's not built yet. But he says, yeah, basically he's saying the people messed it up. I'm going to still set up my tent far from you guys and still come in and commune with God. Okay? So everyone that sought the Lord went to the tent, went to Moses. Well, everyone stood at their own tent and watched Moses go in and out of the tent. Okay? Verse 9, it came to pass. That means not when he first did it, but a while later, it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle or his own tent that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. I hope you didn't miss the importance of that. God was so upset with his people, he took his presence away from the people. This act of Moses, this faithful act of Moses setting up his own tent and calling it the tabernacle, separating it from all the other tents and, uh, and far from the camp, showed God the faithfulness of Moses and that Moses was interceding for the people. Because of Moses' faithfulness, and man, I hope you caught that. Because of Moses' faithfulness, God came back down, dwelled there, and talked to Moses. Only because of Moses' faithfulness. So when the people saw this, they stood and worshiped the Lord, verse 9 and 10. Verse 11, the Lord had intimate conversations with Moses in the tent, and it also stated that Joshua did not depart from the tent. He stood guard at the tent when Moses went to and from. Our last session is, uh, section is in this chapter, verse 12, the promise of God's presence. Now that sounds good. The promise of God's presence. Moses insisted that the Lord should go with him and with the people. He go Moses again, insisting to God what should happen. Moses reminded God that he had told him before that he told Moses, I know you by name. And you have also found grace and favor in my sight. That is beautiful. So consider this nation as your people. So Moses is saying, you already, I'm calling you on your word. You told me word for word, I have found favor in your sight. So consider this nation, your people. And God said, verse 14, because of what Moses said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Wow. Isn't that powerful? You better underline that in your Bible. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest, okay? And that rest somewhat means as you're traveling, you won't have to be at war, okay? So I will protect you once again and fight your battles 
That's what that means, give you rest, okay? You can kind of compare that to that. So verse 15, Moses says, if your presence does not go with us, then allow us to stay here. We do not want to go outside of your presence and protection. Moses asked to see. Then he went. He did something very bold. He said, well, while I got you here, Lord, and you listening to me, now while you're doing what I asked you to do, Moses asked, allow me to see the glory of the Lord. Amen, somebody. The scripture says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Wow. You cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. That's what the scripture said. So anytime they said the presence of God or, or God was there, God dwelled, that was not God's face. That was his presence. They could see his presence. Okay. So, um, it is said to stand on the rock and I will cover you with my hand and you shall see my back, but my face, you shall not be seen. Uh, when I read that, you know what popped in my head? Uh, Christ Jesus, the solid rock in which I stand. You know, that's what popped into my head. I know it probably did to you. So that's how that chapter ends, okay? God allowed Moses to see his glory. Chapter 33. God said to leave, I will show you my glory. I will go before you. My presence, my angel will go before you and will lead you exactly where I need for you to go. And we know that means to the promised land. So the begging or the intercession of Moses, now God is saying, I will go with you because his plan was still going to go forward. He was just going to reestablish and start all over the nation with Moses. But Moses said, take me as a sacrifice for the people. And because of his faith, God says, no, I will punish those that need to be punished. But we will see there's a lot of punishment is going to be definitely going to be handed down in the next chapters. And you will see God will deal with these people. Okay. God will deal with them. So that concludes chapter 21. We have, and we started about three minutes after. So it's uh, four minutes after I've ended on time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody that's on this Zoom line um, by, by video or by audio. Thank you for everyone that called in on the conference line. Thank you everyone that is viewing this by YouTube at a later date. Please hit subscribe, like, share, hit the notifications. That will help us out a lot to push out this gospel and this Bible study teaching um, to the masses, amen? My prayer is simple, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart was acceptable in the sight of God because he's our savior and he is our redeemer. To God be the glory for everything that has happened on this line. May all the praise, glory, and honor belong to God, the most high God. This is our prayer, amen and amen. Thank you all for coming. I will conclude the session at this time.